My name is Julia Panville. I'm the director of the Future of Land and Housing Program at New England. And I'm so excited to open this discussion on the topic of eviction record sealing, which has been sweeping across the country over the last few years. So far, at least eight states have passed eviction record sealing laws, and eviction sealing legislation is being considered in several other cities and states across the country. In fact, I just learned today that Wisconsin is the latest state to be considering eviction sealing legislation. Eviction sealing legislation does exactly what it sounds like. It seals eviction records, most often records of evictions that are dismissed. These laws protect tenants by limiting the ability of tenant screening companies to access eviction filing data and sell it to landlords, locking tenants, even those who ultimately have their evictions dismissed, out of future housing opportunities. At the same time, eviction sealing laws can obscure access to court records which are the primary data source for tracking evictions and informing policies to prevent them. We're hosting this discussion today to shed light on this wave of legislation, discuss why it's so critical, but also talk about how to balance the need for protection of tenants with the need for preserving data access. We'll start by hearing from two national experts about why eviction record sealing is urgent and necessary and what they've seen in regards to this national trend. Natasha Duarte from the organization Upturn will share context on why eviction, eviction record sealing is so urgent and necessary, and also elevate Upturn's new guidance for sealing laws. Marie-Claire tram Leung will then share more about the momentum that record sealing legislation has gathered, including common trends across states. After Marie Claire and Natasha present, I'll turn it over to my colleague Sabiha Zainobai, who will moderate a discussion between two jurisdictions that have recently passed eviction sale legislation. Scott Davis, the public information officer for the Maricopa County Justice Courts, will share his experience, as will Brittany Ruffin, Director of Policy and Advocacy for the Washington Legal Clinic on the Homeless in Washington, D.C. Brittany and Scott will be joined by Marie Claire and Natasha. Uh, we'll have a panel discussion with the four of them and then leave some room for questions and answers. Uh, please submit your Q&A throughout the duration of the event uh, using the Slido interface. Uh, welcome everyone and we look forward to a fruitful discussion. I'm Natasha Duarte. Um, I work at Upturn. We are a small nonprofit um, based in DC and we do research and advocacy to advance justice in the design, use and governance of technology, including in housing. And so um, I'm here to talk about eviction sealing, of course. And in short, I think states need to be aggressive about sealing eviction records because tenant screening companies are aggressive about collecting and selling those eviction records to landlords. As soon as landlords file for eviction and those filings go up on a court website, data brokers are collecting those records and storing them in databases where they may or may not get updated as the case progresses. And then those tenant screening companies market their services to landlords saying, hey, as a landlord, you need to protect your investment and the safety of your neighbors. And you're taking a huge risk if you rent to someone you know nothing about. They could hurt your property or your neighbors and you might be forced to evict them, which is gonna cost you a lot of money. But don't worry, um, uh, tenant screening companies are saying to landlords because our reports tell you everything you need to know to make a safe and reliable choice. So it's this one-two punch of marketing that tenant screening companies are doing where you need to be afraid, but buy our services and we'll tell you if someone's a good tenant. And the so-called insights in these tenant screening reports come almost entirely from eviction records, criminal records, and credit information. And as we know, all three of these records are products of systemically racist, sexist, and ableist systems. Uh, tenant screening companies repackage this data. They often summarize it so that, for example, a dismissed eviction filing might just become eviction record found on a tenant screening report. They often translate it into a numerical score or a risk assessment, like a red, yellow, or green light, 
so a landlord can do even less of their own analysis. One company, for example, um, called National Tenant Network, on their website, they have a sam sample tenant screening report you can look at. And in that report, the hypothetical tenant gets a failing score from National Tenant Network, seemingly entirely on the basis of an eviction record. So tenant screening companies are encouraging landlords to defer to these scores and to the records on which they're based to make their decisions. And landlords do defer to them. Wan Young So is a researcher at MIT. He recently published a paper showing that landlords tend to follow a blanket screening policy of rejecting tenants based on eviction records, even when they can see that the eviction record was dismissed and that they tend to follow the tenant screening company's risk recommendations. So tenant screening in general takes existing markers of housing insecurity and injustice processes them and generates more housing insecurity along with profits for the industry. And while it's very important to regulate landlords conduct, uh, which is being done across the country through what are known as fair chance housing laws to restrict what landlords can use to screen tenants, unfortunately, we can't rely on that, those kinds of laws alone. Um, enforcement of those laws is limited by factors like tenants not being able to see a full view into the tenant screening process, not having the time or resources to pursue a complaint because they're trying to find housing and it's uh, they just want to sort of move on and apply to the next housing opportunity and landlords providing pretextual reasons for rejecting tenants. Um, so tenant screening companies also regularly publish reports with errors which landlords are unlikely to spot and they sometimes obscure or exclude mitigating information like the fact that a case was dismissed or that it happened a long time ago that could theoretically nudge a landlord not to put so much weight on it. So as a harm reduction step, cutting off access to eviction records at the source has the potential to help a lot more people qualify for housing. And it's an important complement to fair chance housing laws. We need both. So how do you write a law to seal eviction records in your state? It depends on where you live. There are local nuances. But I did write a report with my colleague, Tinuala Dada, who has now uh, moved on to Yale Law School, where we tried to address some common questions that are going to come up pretty much anywhere you're trying to write and pass eviction record ceiling. We were heavily informed by what we learned from local housing advocates in DC who successfully passed a tenant screening and eviction record ceiling law here, including Britt, who you'll hear from later on the panel. Our top recommendation is to seal eviction records immediately at the point of filing so they never become public. And we're far from the first or only people to recommend that, but it is key to stopping data brokers from getting their hands on the records before a case can even be decided. Uh, we re also recommend talking to local courts early in the process so you can find out what kinds of technologies and systems they're working with how you can craft your law to work with existing systems and where you'll need to push those systems to change. We definitely don't have all the answers. And so I'm really glad we're here today to tackle some of the questions about how to seal eviction records without undermining eviction defense work, which often makes use of housing court records, as well as other housing justice organizing efforts that might rely on eviction data. And as we discuss in our issue brief, these goals don't have to be at odds depending on what the needs for data are and how things work in a given jurisdiction, there are policy tools and there are technology tools that we can use to thread this needle so we can have ceiling and we can have effective eviction defense and housing justice organizing. So I can't wait to get into talking about how to do that with um, the others on the panel today. And um, thanks for having me. Um, so my name is Marie Claire Tran Leung. Um, I use she, her pronouns, and I am the Evictions Initiative Project Director at the National Housing Law Project. The National Housing Law Project is a national law and policy organization focused on the rights of low-income tenants in housing. And um, as part, part of the work that we do is that we host the Housing Justice Network, which is comprised of nearly 2,000 legal services attorneys and tenant advocates from across the country. Um, and in that work, we have a sense of what a lot of our members are working on, both in direct services and also at the policy level. And a number of our members 
um, are really focused on eviction ceiling right now in their state local local jurisdiction. Um, and we are seeing really the momentum continue to gather around this type of legislation across the states. Um, Natasha mentioned earlier um, the idea of um, sealing evictions at the time of filing. And we do have um, uh, sometimes point to California as being sort of a pioneer in the space. Um, they have had eviction masking um, for a number of years. And in 2016, um, enacted legislation that would automatically seal eviction filings um, unless the plaintiff landlord prevailed within 60 days. Um, in 2020, Colorado joined California in passing a law um, that would seal eviction filings and records of cases where the tenants prevailed and where the plaintiff prevails, the case information becomes public unless the parties agree otherwise. Um, you know, I think automatic in, in in a lot of ways automatic ceiling is um is this is part of the ideal um, especially at the time of filing but we also know that in a number of states and jurisdictions the infrastructure um and some in some cases the political will will is not widely available and so we have been working with states and localities or advocates in different states and localities who are um trying to push some of these um, in the way that their, their jurisdictions are set up. And so there's a lot of movement, at least towards the, the broader goal. One sort of broader trend I just wanted to sort of lay out there is I think, you know, in the early day, earlier days of the pandemic, um, a number of jurisdictions enacted at least temporary sealing measures out of a recognition that the eviction records that come out of that came came out of those early days shouldn't be used against individuals as they try to obtain housing in the future. So in New Jersey, for example, eviction records from April 2020 to August 2021 20, are sealed. Um, similarly, Illinois has automatic sealing of eviction records between the two the two year period between March of 2020 and March of 2022. Um, and Nevada as well also had um, also seals um, summary records of summary evictions for non-payment of rent um, during the pandemic. Um, and, a, and a lot of the advocates in many of those places right now are trying to um, look at how to make some of those temporary measures more permanent um, and to make them a permanent feature of their, their court systems. Um, and some of the issues that I think our, our members have brought up um, in the course of working um, on these measures is questions around um, how, how the um, ceiling is triggered or how the ceiling um, takes place. We have a number of jurisdictions who rely on um, petitions in order to have the record sealed. And, you know, I think as was stated earlier, automatic sealing is preferred. I think in the long run, um, there is there is will be less administrative costs to both the tenant and the courts. However, in order to do that, there's a lot of upfront costs and investments that some courts may not currently be ready to make. Um, and that may require additional legislation or appropriations that um, you know, it takes time to, to gather, I think, at the state level. And in the meantime, we have a number of jurisdictions who are trying to make progress with the peti petition model and using that as a way to open the door for automatic sealing down the line. Um, the other thing I just wanted to note is I think, you know, I think today we'll talk um, a, 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 about legislation in a number of places. Um, and I also wanted to note just that for some in, in some of the work that we've done, we've also seen places where advocates are trying to make changes um, where legislation may not be available because of the political landscape. Um, and so in some places there have been um, success in trying to rely upon the inherent authority of state courts to enact some sort of relief around eviction records um, and trying to, to appeal to state courts where um, the state legislatures may not be um, a viable source of protection. 
um, and others where there might not be as much level, as much success at the state courts. Um, there are some efforts to be made at the at the at the local county and um, level. Um, and again, I think all of these all of these um, efforts um, in our network, I think, have been coming together to try to just really find relief on the ground um, for tenants as where we can find them. Um, today, you know, we'll spend time talking about the balance between privacy interests and access for research and policy development, and that is very much at the forefront of a lot of the work that um, our advocates have been doing. And then um, the last thing I just wanted to bring up is, um, you know, I think um, for, for a number of folks who have worked sort of in the criminal records space for a number of years, there have been a lot of progress there um, that could potentially be models and it's not one to it's not apples to apples in terms of the the um comparison but i think in places like pennsylvania where they have been able to create a clean slate initiative where there is automatic sealing of of criminal records um, advocates there have been trying to see where there might be a potential for um, building upon that model or modifying that model in the eviction court system, um, where there might already be infrastructure for, for the criminal record space. Um, and then ultimately, I think with, with many of the advocates that we work with, um, eviction sealing is part of a broader infrastructure of eviction prevention protections that Natasha alluded to, um, looking at uh, protections such as anti-discrimination on the basis of eviction records, looking at how this could work with eviction diversion and mediation programs, um, and broader right to counsel for tenants um, to help maintain balance of power or achieve balance of power in the court system between landlords and tenants. Um, so just having, I think, keeping in mind that eviction ceiling, I think, is um, just a one, I think, tool in the broader toolbox and and understanding how that can um, operate in this um, infrastructure, I think, is is really important. Um, and so um, with that, I think I'll turn things over to Sabiha. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marie Claire and Natasha. Um, that was really helpful context on um, both why eviction record sealing is urgent and necessary and why we're seeing so many cities and counties and states uh, take up legislation across the country right now. Um, so my name is Sabiha Zainalbai and I am a senior policy analyst at the Future of Land and Housing Program at New America. Um, and this next panel is titled How to Preserve Access to Eviction Data While Protecting Tenant Privacy. Um, and in addition to Natasha and Marie Claire, we'll be hearing from um, Scott Davis, the Public Information Officer from Maricopa County Justice Courts, and Britt Ruffin, um, the Director of Policy and Advocacy at the Washington um, Legal Center, sorry, Legal Clinic for the Homeless in Washington, D.C. Um, and so during today's panel, the goal is really to learn from their experiences, both during the, the drafting process of um, eviction record sealing legislation and during the implementation phase to gain some insights and um, learn a little bit more, uh, you know, and potentially apply lessons learned um, from these experiences to other cities and states grappling uh, with some of these tensions. So um, it's already been well laid out that, uh, you know, eviction records are, you know, harm the, the future housing security of, um, of tenants um, and that eviction record ceiling is necessary and urgent to prevent that discrimination. Um, but at the same time, the primary data source for evictions, uh, since they're run through our county court systems, is can be partially obscured if um, eviction record ceiling laws are not designed and implemented carefully. So today we just wanted to spend a little bit more time talking about um, the experience of cities and states that have grappled with exactly this. Um, so I'm gonna ask questions to the panel. Um, everyone should feel, I'll direct questions to specific panelists, but everyone should feel free to weigh in if they have um, something to share. And just as a reminder for the audience, um, feel free to drop questions for the Q&A uh, session after this panel into um, the Slido feature. So to start, um, I'm going to start with Scott and Britt. Um, can you just share a little bit more about the eviction record ceiling law that was recently passed um, in Arizona and Washington, D.C.? Um, and 
a little bit more about what the sealing regime um, entails. But would you like to go first since it seems like you all did that before we did? Sure, no problem. Um, so the sealing, eviction sealing law in DC um, actually was coupled with some larger uh, legislation um, that involved tenant right, tenant protection rights as well um, for applicants. But the specific portion of the eviction record sealing law, it makes sure that um, there's a process that eviction case records are sealed um, with automatically. So if they're sealed automatically um, in two parts. So they're actually sealed automatically within 30 days if there's no, if there's, if there's case resolution um, where there's no judgment for a landlord and then three years automatically um, if there is a judgment for the landlord. But there's also a set of eight factors um, by which uh, a person can, upon motion, request that their records uh, be sealed as well. And so um, that's the setup for our um, law currently, but it also allows tenants um, and their attorneys and their future attorneys um, to have non-public access to copies of their seal records. Um, and it still includes allowing researchers to access um, that data um, with protections there for personal identifiable uh, information. And that was um, a key portion because a lot of the information, as you stated, um, that we have on evictions and even getting to the point of knowing um, how um, effective it is to seal and to make sure that people are having the greater access to getting housing um, were studies that, um, a specific study that came out of Georgetown um, that in here in DC that looked at the evictions in DC and how problematic they were and the things that they were being filed for and that they were being filed and some of them didn't even go through, um, but it really had a significant impact on uh, the housing market and people's access to housing. Uh, that's fascinating, all of the ins and outs of that. In, in Arizona, our legislature this year came up with this uh, bill, and it, it passed both houses and was eventually signed into law. It's very simple, though, in that if an eviction filing is dismissed for whatever reason, uh, the case gets sealed. There's no um, direction on how to seal cases, whether it's automatic or whatever. It's just seal the case. Um, and there's there's some other reasons for example, if the landlord and the tenant stipulate to vacate the judgment and seal it, then it becomes sealed. And, and some of that wording gets very specific and very tricky. But overall, it was a very simple law. It's less it's like three paragraphs or something that became part of our Arizona revised statutes. There's certainly provisions for the tenant and their attorneys and, and court folks to be able to access those records, but the word is sealed and that's pretty much it. It was left up to each court um, uh, system in the state to figure out how they're going to do that. Great. Yeah, thank you for that context. Um, so you know, the upturn report that Natasha alluded to earlier um, specifies that you know, a sealing regime does not need to be a binary system in which records are either completely open to the public or completely closed. Um, and I'm wondering, Natasha, if you'd be able to just explain a little, a little bit more what was meant by this um, in the report. And then um, to the rest of you, uh, and specifically Scott and Britt, uh, you know, talk a little bit about, you touched on it, but how Arizona and DC's record sealing laws think about this binary when it comes to data access. Yeah, so it basically means what you said, that a record can be closed to the general, to general public access, but made available by the court under limited circumstances for specific uses, like as Britt and Scott were mentioning for attorneys representing clients in housing cases. Um, a concern that gets raised when we talk about sealing eviction records at the point of filing in particular, so while a case is still moving through the court process, is what happens when someone like a tenant in that case or their attorney needs access to information about the case so that they can represent themselves or their clients. Um, one reason this comes up um, and a reason we talked about um, that it was so important for us to say that sealing is not a binary is that courts in some jurisdictions do sometimes think of sealing in a binary way where they're putting a record into a sealed envelope forever that can't be opened by anyone. 
In reality, that's actually almost never true. Um, even with like sort of the strictest sealing regime, um, you can almost always petition a court to unseal a record if you have a good enough reason. Um, and for example, in the world of criminal records, in many jurisdictions, they um, seal certain criminal records that are not publicly available, but give police wide ranging access to sealed records, which is a big problem, by the way, I'm absolutely not advocating for giving police access to sealed records, but I'm just using that as an example to show that the government can live in that gray area between open and closed records when it really wants to. Um, but more importantly, uh, another reason this comes up is that advocates and attorneys have historically, in some cases, struggled to get access to sealed records when they need them to represent clients or for other critical um, uses that they should be able to get access to them for. Um, so in DC, where um, eviction records aren't sealed until the conclusion of the case, attorneys still had historically had trouble getting access um, and had to go to the courthouse in person to get access, um, or, or you know, the parties to the case had to go in person to get access, which can be a big barrier. Um, and so that's why the new DC law requires the court to provide those records to attorneys electronically. Um, I'll also mention that advocates in Connecticut drafted a sealing law that um, eventually didn't pass, but would have allowed any attorney licensed in the state to access eviction records electronically um, to represent clients or prospective clients. Um, and so that can help cover like um, the outreach that um, attorneys or other advocates might do to people who have um, received eviction notices who may not know that, or who are being evicted, who may not have received a notice or may not know they've been evicted. Um, and don't know like when to show up in court or what to do next. Um, of course, each additional access includes some risk that eviction records could end up in the hands of data brokers. Um, but these are trade-offs and needs that can be figured out in the drafting process. They shouldn't be upfront roadblocks to sealing records. Scott um, or Britt, if you have anything to add. Well, I was going to say that those, I think in those in Arizona, those things were not upfront roadblocks. They were things after the drafting process, after the passing process, and then we had to figure all of those things out, um, which is why I, I love one of Upturn's um, points in the report was work with the courts when you're drafting this legislation. It's crucial because legislators don't know court terms. And there are words that we use in court that mean specific things. And if you write that into legislation, then that's what's going to happen and not what you really intended. Yeah, um, I would definitely uh, agree, of course. And I think that one thing that we you know, learned in the drafting process, this eviction record sealing went out first in a temporary measure. And so we saw thousands of records being sealed. Um, but then we caught pieces that weren't matching up with what the legislative intent. So the, the, the portion that allowed people to seal records on motion, they were supposed to be um, specific and, and things that the court was supposed to do. And it was being, through a drafting you know, kind of interpretation, it was looked at as where the judge could decide if it was. And so in the second iteration, we had to go back to say, oh no, this is a shall. This is not a permissive um, statement or structure here in this bill. Um, so we had to you know, fix that. And also making sure that um, we had eviction record attorneys that were you know, worried that they, they wanted to make sure that they were gonna have access to be able to move forward in future cases. We also have tenants who would try to go to court and access their, their cases, but because it had been sealed, they can't find it on the docket, or it, they're told that they don't have a case when there's still some ongoing processes in, the, in, in a court case or settlement agreements. And so that was problematic. And so we wanted to make sure that people were able to access their own records um, and see the information about their own cases, but also that their attorneys were able to do that and future attorneys. And I, I think part of our legislation too, of course, we expect everyone, all of us that are members of the bar to, you know, act in a, a certain way, right? That is, is professional and law abiding. Um, but, you know, eviction record, uh, landlords have attorneys too, right? And so we wanna make sure that even in saying that attorneys can access, 
they have to, that the court is setting up processes where that people who are asking for these records, that the uh, tenants, specific tenants that they relate to are giving the authorization for them to access these records. Um, and so that was important to make sure that um, at the bottom line that we are trying to do as much as possible to protect the data of, of the people involved. Yeah, thank you so much for all that. That's really interesting too. And it reminds me, Marie Claire, what you were saying too, you work with so many cities um, and states that are you know, looking to make permanent temporary legislation. And it, uh, I'd be really interested to hear um, or to know, um, you know, down the line, if you're seeing people sort of learn throughout that temporary legislation process and then make tweaks to their permanent, leg permanent legislation. Um, but just to follow up on Britt, um, what you started to talk about with DC's process, you know, I know that the record um, sealing law was the result of a, you know, a longstanding coalition of community members and service providers and advocates and government representatives who were working to identify and lower the barriers to accessible affordable housing in DC. I, I believe, you know, well, that began well before the pandemic. Um, so you mentioned that this was part of a package of other sort of tenant protection. So in addition to curbing excessive application fees and strengthening protection from discrimination, um, you know, it, the system, the, this legislation also obviously created a record sealing regime. Um, and so can you just share a little bit more, um, both you and Natasha, on the process used to develop and pass record sealing legislation and, um, you know, specifically pull out any pieces that um, impacted the access to data question during that process? Sure. Well, yeah, this, this was definitely a year started attempt to Oh, Britt, Britt, I'm having a I'm having a little bit of trouble hearing you. I don't know if you every time I think it, you lean back, it um, gets a little quieter. All right, can you hear me now? Yes. Thank so you. So every time that you know we know that access to deeply affordable housing is very is scarce and. In the effort to minimize barriers, um, we had a series of legislation. So this final legislation was actually a combination of a few pieces of legislation that ended up into this one bill. And so there was legislation on strictly eviction record sealing. There was legislation on tenant protections and you mentioned application fees. So part of this legislation also caps application fees at $50 um, and has a variety of uh, expectations and creates uh, rights for applicants around what they can expect during the application process. Um, and it does, it puts legislation, it puts language in there around eviction rights and, you know, what landlords have to do and what um, tenants can expect. And so this legislation covers all of that. And I think in moving, in it moving the way it did um, during the pandemic, honestly, the pandemic was a big part of how this legislation moved. And I think the focus around the pandemic and there being a public health emergency and the shelter in place and stay at home. There are a lot of people who can't afford homes and don't have access to homes and are constantly being denied um, housing because of these barriers. And a lot of these barriers, um, the eviction records being one of them, um, that they are seeing, you know, landlords, they, they're, they're having vouchers um, they're, or not vouchers, but they are, it's hard for them to get access, whether it's um, credit scores, not finding out why they're denied, um, but eviction records, having eviction records was a big part of it. And so um, the will of our council in addressing it was really, be, I, I, it was spurred by the fact that we were in a pandemic and people needed to be able to access housing and that we were also putting forth um, the request that the council create you know, additional housing vouchers and subsidies for people having housing. And so in creating these subsidies, they needed to have a way to make sure these subsidies could be used and that the subsidies and the money that they were putting towards vouchers, um, towards creating new housing access um, subsidies were actually gonna be able to be used because these barriers were minimized. Yeah, thank you so much. Um... And then, you know, I wanted to talk a little bit, Scott, you sort of sit uh, at a 
very crucial um, position um, being in the courts and sort of a distributor of eviction data to housing stakeholders across Arizona. Um, and, you know, Maricopa County Justice Courts has been known for their efforts to make eviction records more consistent and available for research, um, thanks in large part to your efforts. And, um, you know, I'm wondering if you can share a little bit more about how the recent record sealing law that went into effect may impact what it is you provide to, um, you know, legal aid providers and other tenant organizers and other advocates um, and research organizations across the state. So we release data once a month. We have, uh, uh, there are a couple of ways that people can access data. We have subscribers like credit companies and things like that that buy bulk data once a month. And then I send out a, 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 what I think is a comprehensive Excel sheet of evictions that have happened in the past month, or at least cases that have been filed in the last month. Um, we have struggled with, number one, releasing data more often than that, um, but we are at a once a month release schedule. And part of that is because, um, you know, at the, at the end of the month, when we pull and retrieve that data for sending out, there are thousands of cases that have not been to court yet. And so there are no outcomes. There are no judgments yet. We don't even know if it's case has been dismissed by the time that report is pulled um, with, with 60 or so thousand. For the last 10, 15 years, we've had about varying between 60 and 70,000 eviction cases filed each year in Maricopa County. So again, thousands of those just have had no resolution by the end of the month. So when we are talking about sealing cases, um, the, the determining factor of when we will release data is, well, when is the case sealed? How long did that case take to get through the system and be dismissed or the landlord and the tenant, again, stipulate to have it vacated, dismissed and sealed? Um, so right now we have held off on putting out our data from October because we know that there are still all of those cases that haven't been sealed yet that are going to be sealed. And if I were to release all of that on November 1st or whatever that would have been, um, then that's again, thousands of cases with information out there for anybody to use. And those cases then are going to be sealed a week or two weeks or maybe three weeks later. And so in my communications to subscribers and other users, I've said, I can't, just can't in good conscience put out this data knowing that it's going to be restricted later on. And I can't control what you're going to do with it. I can ask you and tell you that you have to remove these files from your records, but I can't count on people doing that. Not that I don't trust all of our wonderful research colleagues, but there are always um, bad actors or inattentive actors in, in every field. So we are putting a delay on that until we are comfortable that the, the cases from the previous month have been fully adjudicated in whatever way that's going to be. That still is not going to capture those cases where six months later, the landlord and the tenant come back to court and file that motion to vacate, dismiss, and seal. So we're just at a point where we're, we're just sorting through how long is that going to take? And our, our record sealing law just went into effect September 24th, I think. So it's only been, uh, it's less than two months now. So we've had less than just really one full month of data and just one week in September where we are grappling with this. Yeah, thanks so much for walking us through that process. And that really tees up my next question, um, which is that, you know, and everyone has kind of alluded to this already, that the ability to have um, a system that protects tenants and preserves access to da data heavily depends on the, not just the policy in place, but the case management software used by county courts and the guidance and protocols that are provided to the clerks and the admin system administrators who are in charge of really, um, you know, implementing a uh, sealing regime that is in accordance with the law and the intent of the law as well. Um, and so, you know, we've also heard from you, Scott, and just others around the country that, um, you know, court clerks will adhere pretty strictly to the laws on the books, which really emphasizes 
the importance of clear guidance um, when it comes to eviction record sealing laws. So, you know, I know people talked a little bit about uh, engaging uh, court personnel early in the drafting process, but I'm wondering if there are any other um, lessons learned that um, Scott, Britt, Natasha, and uh, Marie, Marie Claire, you can share from your experiences or what you're hearing from other cities and counties as to how to, you know, what to necessarily engage them on and, and, and kind of how to do that as well. Anybody care to go first? I could talk evictions all day long, but, so I want to give others a chance to weigh in. Um, I'll just make a few observations, but um, definitely let others speak more specifically to state and local experiences. Um, so one is that I think it would be a mistake if courts or um, others sort of came away with the assumption that they have to have some sort of particular technology or sophisticated technology to be able to do eviction record sealing. Um, all courts can seal some records or keep records confidential. At the most basic level, when a landlord files an eviction case, a court can require that they use initials only or a pseudonym instead of um, including a tenant's full name in the filing. So um, it doesn't have to be this like perfectly executed with sophisticated like court records management technology thing to be um, effective, like good enough eviction record sealing. Um, so I think, you know, you can work with what you have to, to make it work. Um, the second thing is having said that, Tyler Technologies is um, a big technology vendor of records management software, maybe the biggest one in courts across the country. And they do provide the capability to have a public access portal where anyone can access public court records as well as a system where only authorized parties can get login credentials and access confidential records that the public can't see. So um, in DC, when we were um, talking to the court, like it was um, one of the things we did was like, do just do some quick research on like, okay, what are you working with? And what can we find out about its capabilities from just like, um, you know, there are lots of um, things online, like, um, the sort of brochures that um, court management systems put out there about what explaining what they can do, um, as well as contracts or work orders that they have with other courts um, that can tell you what sort of systems or capabilities they provided to other courts. So um, there's a contract, um, I think it's in California where like Tyler Technologies had promised that they would um, provide a system in California that would have the capabilities under California law of sealing records automatically at the point of filing um, and allowing them to be unsealed at a certain point. Um, and then, you know, I've learned a lot from watching a video from the Vermont courts uh, website where they, they made a video just explaining to people how to use, um, they have the sort of online, the public portal, which is general access to the records that are public, as well as the um, sort of privileged access um, login system uh, where people can access records that are confidential, but that they are allowed to access for specific purposes. So watch that video, you know, sort of learn how it works. And that can help you um, talk to court personnel about like, here's what we understand the system you have may be able to do. Is that your understanding? Um, because they may not be Sure, right. There might be things that the vendor knows that court personnel are not up to date on what's possible, or there may be things that they need to go and ask the vendor to implement for them that they just haven't implemented. Um, so that kind of just basic research, I think, has been really helpful. I think building on that, I think the basic that research, but I think also the conversations of engaging with the court personnel was really important in even getting buy-in and what we were what we were trying to do um, to get that feedback to say, well, what's happening now? And like, this is what we are looking for. This is, this is the capability. And um, in DC specifically, the court was also going through a process of changing out software at the time that all of this was happening. And so to figure out like where it's where it is currently to where it's going and what the capabilities of the new system and discussing that with the court personnel who would be responsible for this. Um, I think was really important. Scott, 
Scott, do you want to weigh in at all um, as someone who sort of sits on the courts before we move to um, our last question before Q&A? Let's go ahead and move to the last question. We can cover more things that way. Sure. Um, so, you know, everyone kind of alluded to this, that this is eviction record sealing is a tool and a tool, a very important tool, but in a larger toolbox of um, eviction prevention policies. And, you know, um, from the upturn report, you know, we understand that sealing at the point, automatic sealing at the point of filing is the most likely to protect tenants from ending up on tenant screening companies databases. Um, or allowing this data to get into the hands of people who might um, abuse it. But, you know, I think most or a lot of record sealing um, regimes in place today are not automatic at the point of filing. And so I'm, I was wondering if you, um, you know, a lot of them, as Scott walked us through, are sealed at the conclusion of the case. And I'm wondering if um, you all have any thoughts on complementary policies um, which are necessary to protect tenants from um, having an eviction filing on their record. I do, but I just spoke, so I, I want to give others a chance to go first. I saw um, I saw you unmute, Scott, so we can go to you and then Natasha and then um, Britt or Marie Claire, if you have anything to add. Well, I was going to say that Yes, our, our filing process takes place at the end of the case. And I know that people always question um, whether before that ev eviction records are searchable, are they scrapable, are they usable, sellable? And the answer is yes. And that's a, uh, I think an unintended loophole in the Arizona law that I, I've been talking to reporters about for months, hoping someone will bite on that and get that story out there. And I've had one little bit of interest, but nothing that went anywhere to do anything about it, because those cases are in, in Arizona and in most course jurisdictions, we post dockets online. So you can go on the, our website and see what cases are coming up today in any one of the 26 Maricopa County Justice Courts. Well, in, in out of 26 Justice Courts on a Monday, we probably have 10 that are doing evictions. Well, how many of those are going to be sealed later on? So that information is out there. Um, that's That's a tough one. We don't have a way to stop that without some kind of policy in place that says we have to do that because the practice for years has been this is what we do and that's part of a battle I think with any court system is going to be well this is what we do and we've done it this way for years and it's a matter of changing changing minds and changing um, people's ideas of what's right and what's not right the other the other battle that courts have in that is look we're a neutral party we're, we're going to do our business, and it's not up to us what anyone else is going to do with our data. That's, that's up to others. And so, you know, it's kind of like saying if you're going to change a court form to, um, instead of white, have the paper be yellow. Well, I don't care. Okay, if you tell us to do it with yellow, we'll do it yellow. That's kind of the thing with eviction sealing records is it's not, on one hand, it's not a court system's job to protect the tenant's future. Now, I say that saying yeah, that's best for society and we get that, but that's not our mission. Our mission is to adjudicate the cases that come to us and to follow the rules that were given by the Arizona Supreme Court and the state legislature. And that's where we are with the sealing records. Sure, we're doing it and we're not unhappy to be doing it, but it, it sure could have been worked out better on the front end instead of having um, so much discretion of what judges or clerks can do and how they enter those records, which determines if they get sealed or not, which is a long answer, more than y'all asked, but I thought that was important to add. Um, yeah, so um, first, I think in terms of immediate harm reduction, now is the time for states to pass laws that restrict the kinds of information that tenant screening companies can include in their reports. Over this summer, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau published an interpretive rule where they affirm that states have the authority to regulate what tenant screening companies and other consumer reporting agencies include on their records, including they specifically called out eviction records 
as a prime example of information that states can and should be restricting. So um, not just as a complement to crime records off, eviction records off at the source and in the courts, also making sure that we are um, deeply restricting um, the eviction records that actually get included on tenant screening uh, reports, if not um, eliminating them. Um, also, uh, Marie Claire said something um, at the beginning of um, the event that I think is really important, that sealing is one tool in the broader toolbox of shifting power to tenants. The underlying problem here is housing insecurity and injustice. We need a transformed housing system. We need to support communities that are trying to experiment with and build alternative housing models. Um, start removing housing from the speculative anti-tenant market and make it actually available for people to live in. So I think it's really important that we got down to the weeds of like ceiling, um, but don't want to lose the bigger picture of like, as Marie Claire said, yes, this is, we need a whole picture of transforming um, the system and shifting power to tenants. Um, I'll just add that, you know, in addition to the tenant screening companies, I think broader protections against um, the use of eviction records by landlords in the future is also necessary um, because I think, and, and par partially to get the to get the protection in place, but then also to engage sort of the stakeholders and a community around the broader conversation about why eviction records really should not um, should not um, keep people from housing in the first place. I mean, again, I think during the pandemic we saw a lot of jurisdictions understand that there's limited that there's probably limited value in using an eviction record against somebody where you know a global pandemic impacted their ability to pay rent um and taking that broader conversation and, and bringing it to um the 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 obstacles that tenants continue to face today in this climate of rising rents skyrocketing rents and inflation and seeing all of the the um the barriers that tenants face and and the importance of housing security and so i think you know um eviction ceiling eviction ceiling is very critical to to make sure that you know bad actors don't necessarily get their hands on the records but we also have to make sure that um that we look at the tenant screening companies um who can proliferate that and undermine the overall ceiling regimes that um, that courts um, work very hard to get into place and then um, also target landlords who will, might over rely on it um, and kind of stand in the way of tenants um, getting state safe and stable housing. And I just wanted to add, I definitely concur with exactly what Natasha and Marie Claire just said. And that eviction record ceiling, it's a it's a tool and it's it's a, a tool in the toolbox to expand access to housing. Um, but there are just so many things um, that can be addressed from better regulation of these tenant screening companies, but also addressing really how applicants and tenants get access to housing that's very scarce. Um, and that includes looking at using things such as credit score, um, you know, other things that can be proxies for you know, other forms of discrimination, racial discrimination, source of income discrimination, um, and addressing all of those things um, to make sure that we are, we are expanding housing and minimizing all of these barriers. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I think we'll go to, we have a little bit of time for some audience Q&A. Um, and so we have had some good questions come in and I'm just gonna start with this one. Um, someone asked, is there model legislation out there for this? Um, I know that that depends in part on what your goals are, um, but I thought I would pose that to the panel. Um, and Natasha, I know you did mention Connecticut legislation earlier um, that didn't pass, but um, just an opportunity to uplift any cities, counties, or states legislation that you think might be working particularly well. Or just plug the report again, since there's some guidance in that. Yeah, I mean, one of the reasons we did it was because there isn't a um, sort of one model the way there has been a, sort of a model emerging for like um, fair chance housing, um, restricting what landlords do. Um, but there are, there's lots of good um, work being done sort of experimenting in different states. And yeah, I think Connecticut um, is a good one to look at. Um, 
of course, the DC legislation has a lot of excellent things in it. Um, so yeah, nothing else to add. Great. Um, someone asked specifically about the role that court CMS vendors have played in the implementation of these policies, which we've touched on, and they asked um, how have they hurt or hindered these policies. And I'll just add, um, I know that in Illinois, there was a little bit of the temporary COVID ceiling law was not necessarily made permanent in part because of blowback from the um, court systems in, um, you know, being able to implement what was uh, in the legislation. And I'm curious uh, if you all have specific types of guidance that's important to share with court staff or judicial leadership or legislatures working on record ceiling policies. Well, I would say to, to court personnel working on this, um, and, and the analogy I always use is there are 27 different ways to get to your Circle K or your 7-Eleven or your Quick Trip or whatever your convenience store is in your state. There are also 27 different ways to process an eviction case and, and tons of different codes depending on that CMS. And so you, for any court personnel is crucial to think of everything and then test it after the law has gone into effect and audit and make sure that you're doing things right, that you didn't miss, oh, we forgot that, you know, if you enter a dot after seal, then it won't do it or something like that. There are all kinds of little tiny intricacies. Yeah, I would say that our, our Oh, Britt, if you, I think if you, uh, having a hard time hearing you, sorry. Can you hear me now? Yes. Um, in DC, our legislation went into effect in May, um, at least the parts around the uh, record ceiling. And I think that this is going to be, you know, seeing how it's playing out, seeing how it's working um, is going to be crucial for any future, um, you know, tweaks that may need to happen in future le uh, legislation. But I also think being as specific as you can in legislation while leaving room for court personnel to um, utilize their own systems and figure out what works there. I think being specific about what is intended, like there are specific provisions in the DC law saying that even you know, sharing data for scholarly purposes or, or uh, research purposes that they have to um, have the request of the court, of course, but it, it has to go through a certain thing. You have to have a, a written data use agreement showing, you know, where, how this data is going to be used, um, uh, showing procedures for data storage and how the data is going to be destroyed. Um, you know, all those things have, have to be presented in the request to the court. And so I think putting, you know, kind of a framework around what the intention is, is, is crucial. Yeah, I'm so absolutely. glad you said that. Um, so I'll just add this one little thing. There is no provision in our law for anyone other than tenants and their attorneys and court personnel to get those records. I'm in sort of a, well, it's a soft battle with our attorney over sharing something as simple as the zip codes that are with those sealed eviction cases. And I'm told, no, well, I don't like that. So I'm, I'm fighting that, but I, I would love to have seen some kind of provision made for special cases. Yeah, thanks, Scott. Um, it's really helpful to hear about lessons learned um, even two months in. So really appreciate all of that. And I'm just gonna pass it over, uh, pass it back to Yulia to uh, just close us out. Thanks so much, Sabiha. And thank you so much for uh, to our excellent panel. I'll just uh, close by noting that, uh, so for the audience on the back end, we see the questions come in and I've been noticing that these questions are very specific, very actionable, clearly based on the questions that we're getting in. There are lots of folks in the audience who are grappling in real time with eviction ceiling legislation. So we're so glad that we were able to host something on a topic that seems pertinent. Uh, we will be sharing back out some information, both a summary of what was discussed on the panel and perhaps some answers to some of these questions that we didn't get to in the coming uh, in the coming week. So please look out for that. Uh, thank you again to uh, everybody who tuned in and to our wonderful panel and have a great afternoon.